Well, good morning. It's wonderful to see you here. It's great to be in God's house where it's nice and cool. Amen. Terrific, and we're glad those of you worshiping with us online are here as well. I'm Karen Kraska, one of the associate pastors, and we are delighted to worship with you this morning. As the announcement video said, there's lots going on here at Treach. Our youth choir is actually on youth choir tour. They're headed to Nashville, so please keep them in your prayers. Tomorrow we begin our Mad for Jesus camp, and we'll have about 150, 175 students here. Uh, taking classes and worshiping and just having a wonderful time here on our campus. So it's summer and it's hot, but there's still a lot of cool stuff happening here at Treach. Uh, we are glad to continue our worship series this morning called Weird, where Pastor Daniel is tackling difficult, unusual sections of the Bible that we kind of scratch our head and go, hmm. So uh, I know that you'll be enlightened this morning. If you are a visitor, please go by the info desk as you leave. Otherwise, please sign in. There's a QR code on this little card in your pews, and uh, we want to know you're here. We want to be your church and connect with you. So I'd like for you to please stand as you're able and just tell someone around them, around you how you keep cool this summer. How do you keep cool this summer? to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. And I tried with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. And just when I ran out the road, I met a man I and he told me that I am not alone Yeah, he picked me up, turned me around Placed my feet on solid ground I thank the Master, I thank the Savior Cause you healed my heart, changed my name Forever free, I'm not the same I thank the Master, I thank the Savior Cannot deny what I've seen Got no choice but to believe My doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind So, so long to my old friends Burden in bitterness You can just keep it moving Now nah, you ain't welcome here now till I walk streets of gold I'll sing of how you saved my soul This wayward son has found his way back
sing it out. Hell lost another one. I am free. Oh yeah, I am free. I am free. One more time. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. 
Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Sing. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is our King. Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand. Everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't I've still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense so I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would He fail?
came wind blew my house was built on you I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through rain came winds blew my house was built on God, as we were praying this morning in practice, God, we pray that that this time, this space would just be sacred to you, that you would be honored and loved and worshiped, and that um, you would be our foundation, Father. You would be everything else would be built on you. God, we like to say, um, I like to say when I begin worship, God, I like to say that, God, let everything else melt away so we can focus on what you want to tell us this morning. And God, that's my little way of um, trying to keep my foundation strong. Because there's so many distractions. There's so many things you can get focused on other than you, Father. God, I ask that you would give us that gift of not only in worship, but as we listen to the message this morning, just complete focus and reliance on you and that you would be worshipped well this morning. It's in your good name we pray. Amen. Hi, church. Thank you so much for your generosity. Your giving helps support so many ministries here. The Special Needs Butterfly Ministry had an amazing lemonade stand this past weekend, and your support has helped us achieve so many goals. After the church services, we were excited to have a lemonade stand at the front entrance of the church. The butterflies were so excited to provide fresh lemonade and free hugs to everyone in the congregation. I'm excited to say that we raised over $600 for the Good Samaritan Fund, which benefits people in need in our community. Thank you for coming out and helping us reinforce daily living skills, social skills, and helping us have purpose to serve the community. To support awesome events like this and everything else, simply scan the QR code or text the letters TMUMC to 45777. Thank you.
What are we doing? What? That was weird. That was weird. Man, there's weird stuff happening every week. How does that happen? That's just kind of weird, right? Kind of like our scriptures. We're spending these uh, next several weeks in some tough, some weird, some unique scriptures. Hopefully last week you caught a glimpse of that as we were in uh, Genesis chapter 6 and discovered that sometimes when things go awry and, and aren't quite as we hope, then we need to kind of correct that and, and move in a new direction, right? Uh, and each week we're going to cover some different and unique things, and so uh, today will be no different. Today we're going to um, cover a passage of Scripture that uh, some of us may be familiar with, but not all of us will necessarily enjoy, so I'm just going to lay it right out there that we're, we may not all enjoy that. But part of what we recognized several uh, months ago was that as a church that values biblical relevance, that we need to not only cover and address passages that bring hope and joy and encouragement, but we also need to uh, offer scriptures that sometimes challenge us, sometimes don't make sense to us initially. Uh, and so um, that's what we want to do. And today we're going to cover a passage in Genesis again, Genesis chapter 19. You might know it as the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And you might know that story and understand that it's a little weird on a couple of different levels. It's weird about what happens in Sodom itself, but it's also weird what Lot does in response to the strangeness of the Sodomite people. And so we're going to spend a little time in that and hopefully discover ways that we can move forward and understand that Scripture and have fun all at the same time, right? So here's what I want to do. I want to start a, a little back before Genesis chapter 19. So uh, back in Genesis chapter 13, we begin a relationship with the nephew of Abraham. Some of you, I hope, will know Abraham. He's the father of many nations. He's kind of the foundation for all of Christianity, Judaism, and the Islam tradition. And uh, we know him well. He kind of set out a great course, and, and uh, all of the nations of the world, all of the people of the world would be blessed by and through Abraham, we're told. Well, Abraham had relatives, right? That's the only way you become father of many nations, right? And so one of his nephews is named Lot. You may have heard of Lot. And uh, as Lot and Abraham kind of tend their sheep, they begin to get pretty um, financially secure in an agrarian society. So much so that at some point it becomes clear that they can't both graze their animals and raise their crops in the same area. So they determine, Abraham does, uh, golly, we got to separate and go our separate ways. So he calls Lot over and he says, hey, Lot, uh, I, we're doing so well. We need to kind of move on beyond wherever we are. And here's what I want to do. I want to just say, you scout out the land. And wherever you want to go, you go. And, and I'll go the other way. If you want to go that way, I'll go this way. But if you want to go that way, I'll go this way. Wherever you think. So Lot kind of scouts out the land. He looks out over the plains and, and he sees what seems to be a fertile place to go. Uh, it's south of what we now know as the Dead Sea, and uh, it becomes what you and I now refer to as Sodom. And the region of Sodom and Gomorrah is where he sort of establishes himself. Well, we move a couple of chapters forward, and we get to a point where uh, Lot's doing his own thing, Abraham's doing his own thing, and all of a sudden Abraham has some guests come up uh, to his homeland, and he wants to entertain them. He wants to offer them the kind of hospitality that the Middle Easterners are known for. And so in Genesis chapter 18, we see that three guests show up, one of whom must be God and two of whom must be angels or messengers, and Abraham rolls out the red carpet. Uh, so much so that uh, we can count at least 11 different things that Abraham does in order to welcome them, in order to make them feel at home, a part of his family, to become uh, holistic, right, and just feel as though all is well with the world. So much so is this a model of hospitality. We use it here at Treach, and many churches use it as the model for hospitality for our hospitality team. To say, hey, this is how you greet people, and this is how you welcome people, and this is how you make people feel at home, and this is how you help people to know this is a home for them, right? And so in this story, not only has Abraham welcomed these strangers well, but God begins to recognize that he's going to have to do something about these people in Sodom. And he knows that Abraham is related to them and knows that Abraham actually loves them. So God approaches Abraham, and in Genesis chapter 18, there's a bit of a conversation that God kind of has almost out loud. It's not a personal conversation with Abraham, but it's a conversation that Abraham can hear. And in 18 verse 20, it says, The Lord cries uh, for, of the injustices from the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he hears that their sins are very serious. 
And he wants Abraham to know this. He wants to express to Abraham, something is awry. Something's not right. And so as, as God expresses that, God knows, and you and I might know if we've read the text, that this isn't the first time that the Sodomites have been identified as not exactly the best people in the world. In fact, if you go back to Genesis chapter 13, where Lot and Abraham separate, literally the verse after which Lot says, hey, I think I'll go over there. That looks like a beautiful place. But in Genesis chapter 13, verse 13, it literally says, now the people of Sodom were very evil and were always sinning uh, against the Lord. Not exactly um, a great way to acknowledge who you are, right? The people of Sodom are evil and sin against God all the time. So this becomes a known entity. For several chapters within the book of Genesis, we hear and see and read about these people in Sodom, and yet this is where Abraham's nephew has gone. And so at the end of this conversation in Genesis chapter 18, God has uh, an encounter uh, with Moses, uh, I mean with Abraham. And that encounter, I call a prayer. You might call it a conversation. But I want to challenge you to go home today and read Genesis chapter 18. It is an absolutely fascinating chapter. And towards the end, as I mentioned, Abraham begins to dialogue with God because he loves Lot and therefore he wants to save the people of Sodom. And so Abraham enters into what you and I have often entered into in a prayer with God. Let's make a deal. You ever made a deal with God in your prayers? I know I have. And so God, uh, Abraham starts off in the conversation with God, the prayer with God. Hey, God, if you'll find 50 righteous people in Sodom, surely you won't condemn them and destroy them. Surely that's how that will work. And God says, well, you know what? If I find 50 righteous people, I won't destroy Sodom. I don't think I'm going to find 50 righteous people, but if I do, I won't destroy them. And Abram is instantly hooked, and he knows that he can hook God. So he takes it one step further. Well, God, I'm really sorry I'm going to ask this, but um, if you find 40 righteous people, would you condemn Sodom? If you find 30 righteous people, if, if you find 20 righteous people, and, and Abraham whittles God down to 10. And ultimately says, God, if you'll find 10, just 10 righteous people, will you please save Sodom? And God agrees. And God is clear that that's not going to happen. But he makes an agreement with Abraham. And there's where we find ourselves now in Genesis chapter 9. Because at this point, Abram's feeling pretty good. He has saved in his mind the people of Sodom. He has saved his nephew Lot. He has saved his family, and he feels good about this. You and I are about to find probably a little different. So in Genesis chapter 19, I want to read the first 11 verses, and this is what you might be familiar with with regard to the people of Sodom. So the two angels, these are the two who were at Abram's house, and now they've left to go to Lot. The two angels arrived in Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to greet them, and bowing low with his face to the ground, he said, Please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and bathe your feet. Then you may be on your own way early. But they said, no, we will spend the night in the square. The square is not a good place to spend the night in most Middle Eastern places, but clearly not in Sodom. So he prepared, uh, but he urged them strongly so that they turned their way and entered his house. He prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. They had not yet lain down when the townspeople, the, the men of Sodom, young and old, all the people to the last man gathered about the house. And they shouted to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may be intimate with them. So Lot went out to them to the entrance, shut the door behind him, and said, I beg you, my friends, do not commit such a wrong. Look, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you please. But do not do anything to these men, since they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, the people of Sodom, stand back. The fellow, they said, came here uh, as an alien, and already he acts the ruler. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. 
And they pressed hard against the person of Lot and moved forward to break the door. But the men stretched out their hands and pulled Lot back into the house with them and shut the door. And the people who were at the entrance of the house, young and old, they struck with blinding light so that they were helpless to find the entrance. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Can we all own that this is a weird passage? Can we all own that this is hard to comprehend both the people of Sodom and what it is they're seeking to do and Lot and what it is he offers to do? And we think to ourselves, man, how does all this work and why is this here and what's this about, right? This is why we wanted to take this and others of these passages in the weird series. So it starts off pretty good, right? I mean, it starts off, some guests come into the community just like with Abraham. Lot does just like his uncle Abraham, and he welcomes the people. In fact, he welcomes them into the community. He, in fact, uh, implores for them to come into his home because it's not exactly, he doesn't say this, but it's not exactly safe in the town, so don't hang your hat there. Why don't you come into my house? He welcomes them. He pours out a good spread. He cooks a meal for them, has unleavened bread for them, and they eat, and they, it doesn't say this either, but I'm sure they're satisfied, I'm sure they're grateful, I'm sure all is well. It starts off really nice, right? It starts off and kind of invites us into a wonderful, hospitable relationship. And then the next verse. <laughs> Before they laid down for the evening, it says, and I'm reading this morning from the Tanakh. I forgot to mention that. But the Tanakh is the Hebrew Scriptures. It's the Hebrew Bible. Um, the Tanakh is an acronym. The T stands for Torah. The N stands for Nevi'im, which are the prophets. And so in the Hebrew Scriptures, the prophets come after the Torah. And then the KH stands for the Ketuvim, which are the writings, Psalms and Proverbs and Song of Solomon and those kinds of things. And so the Hebrew Bible is in a different order. But it's also uh, the English translation of the Hebrew and translated by Hebrew scholars. So it's a little more uh, attuned uh, to the Hebrew understanding. I wanted to read that because in verse 4, it identifies something interesting. It says, before they lay down, when the townspeople, the men of Sodom, young and old, all the people to the last man. It acknowledges, you see, in the Hebrew that it's not just the men who come to the door. It's not just the men of the town. It's every person in the town. And it wasn't exactly the welcome wagon who came knocking, right? But when they knocked... And the door was opened and Lot stepped out. He was about to offer them hospitality, just like he'd done with the strangers who'd come as well. But he gets sort of accosted. He gets accosted by the townspeople. He gets accosted by all of the people of the town. They're sodomites who are vile, violent violating kinds of people. We read that in chapter 18, right? We heard that they were sinners on a regular basis, and this is literally just perpetuating what they had already known. They want to have their way with the male guests. And I know when some of us read this, we think, well, this is kind of foundational for either homosexuality or sexuality. But I just need for us to know that's not the case at all. What they want to do is rape the guests who have come. They want to violate them. They want to perpetrate sexual violence, much like people in prison, during war, even some gang members. Because when we do that, we can violate you. We can emasculate you. We can make you less than. We can make you feel as though somehow your whole life has been turned upside down. When we cause this sexual violence against you, it's going to make you feel inhuman. That's what they were trying to do. It was the nature of who that town was. The outcry that God spoke to Abraham about in chapter 18 was this very thing. And so here we go. They're going to do the very thing that everyone seemed to know about. They were going to violate the people who were there. That is weird, right? I mean, to this day, for millennia, uh, countries have done this, right? When we go to war, we do this to the women or even to the men in order to say, we're going to conquer you. And it is an atrocious way to live one's life and even to perpetrate war, right? Can we all agree This is not only weird, it's horrible. It's atrocious. It should not happen. 
And oh, by the way, if you look a couple of uh, books into the Bible further to the book of Judges, there's another chapter, chapter 19, that expresses a similar kind of an event where a, a guest comes into a household, they're trying to offer hospitality, and then the townspeople of Gibeah in Judges chapter 19 want to rape the male guest who has come, and, and the, the host simply says, oh, don't have my guest, why don't you take his concubine, and, and that'll be better. And that's where we find ourselves now in Genesis chapter 19, and the stuff that's weird gets even weirder, doesn't it? It moves from sexual violence to Lot saying, hey, hey, don't take my guests. Have my two daughters. They're virgins. Why don't you have them? Now, I, I'm just going to pause here because I, I can see the looks on your face and you're kind of like, we're talking about this stuff in church today? Same thing happened in the 830 service. Probably happened in the 11 o'clock service as well. This is hard stuff, Right? We actually sent notes to the families of young children this week to just kind of remind them or let them know we were going to have a hard time this morning. I say all that because this is hard. It's weird. We don't really know what to do with all of this information, right? And so we need to find out what is this about and, and what do we do with it, right? So Lot offers up his daughters, and as atrocious as that is, it was the accepted practice of the day for Middle Eastern hospitality. I'm not going to justify it. It's clearly wrong. It shouldn't happen. And in today's world, we would think that man is crazy. He ought to be locked up. We shouldn't do that at all. Why is he doing that? But in the biblical days, hospitality took priority over even family. And so that's why he does this. And so it, it begs the question, uh, sometimes, doesn't happen often, but every once in a while in Scripture we have to say to ourselves, man, that was a practice that must have only happened back then. That was a practice that we wouldn't uh, adhere to at all in today's world. And I hope we would all agree that if someone was trying to do something atrocious to our house guests today, we would not offer our daughters up to them. Can, 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 can I get a hand raise on that? Would, thank you for just affirming that. I just really appreciate it. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure and make it clear, okay? So he, he, uh, he offers that up, and the people of Sodom think that he's judging them. <laughs> Imagine that. They get all bent out of shape. You came here as an alien, and now all of a sudden you're playing the judge. Who are you to think that of us, right? And you're just thinking to yourself, yeah, I am. Why wouldn't I? <laughs> you're trying to harm my guests. You're trying to create havoc. You're trying to uh, violate people. And so, what happens next, of course, is the destruction of Sodom. And if you read the rest of chapter 19, you begin to realize that they needed to be destroyed, that it was a horrible, atrocious thing. And what we begin to also recognize is this isn't the only place in Scripture that we identify that Sodom has gone completely awry, that this place is full of violence and does violate people. In fact, what takes shape here in Genesis chapter 19 is not the totality of the vileness of Sodom. When we read some of the prophets, we begin to see that it's much more broad, that it's much more deep, and I want to just point that out to us, that the sins of Sodom are not just what take place on this day in this chapter. As if, for instance, when you go to the prophet Isaiah, who's writing hundreds of years after this occurrence, after Sodom has been destroyed, the prophet Isaiah in the first chapter likens the Israelite nation to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he does it like this. He says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Well, those people are already gone. That, those towns have already been destroyed hundreds of years before. He's saying to the Israelites, you're just like them. You're doing the exact same things that they are. And a part of what Isaiah goes on to say in the same chapter is this, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. What he's saying is, clearly Sodom and Gomorrah must not have been doing this, and you Israelites currently must not be doing this. Relearn your craft, friends. Relearn how to do what God is calling you to do. It wasn't just Isaiah. If we go to the prophet Jeremiah in the 23rd chapter, likewise, long after Sodom and Gomorrah have been destroyed, he says this, in the prophets of Jerusalem I saw something horrible. 
They commit adultery and tell lies. They encourage evildoers so that no one turns from their wickedness. In my eyes, they are no better than Sodom. Its people are like Gomorrah. So here Jeremiah is identifying that some of the sins of Sodom must have been adultery, must have been um, uh, overlooking the needy, must have been quite literally encouraging evil and wickedness, right? We're not done, friends. You go to Ezekiel in the 16th chapter, and in the 49th verse, he simply says, Sodom's sin, and he gets real direct, he gets real straightforward. Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony, and laziness, while the poor and needy suffered outside her door. Man, they were full of it. (laughs) They were doing almost anything and everything wrong. You could even say it was like they were the the pinup people or the poster children for the seven deadly sins, right? Pride and lust and envy and gluttony and all of those things, right? They were in excess and they were harming people and they were causing violence. And and so we ask ourselves on a day like this, so man, why do we need this story? What is this all about? And I think there's probably a lesson or two here. I reckon one of the first lessons is um, behavior matters, right? Because, I mean, a a part of the problem with Sodom was the behavior of perpetrating violence, of perpetuating excess, of living in gluttony, of being prideful, right? All, All of these things, of overlooking the needy, these are all behaviors, right? And they're negative behaviors, and and therefore I think what we glean from Sodom is behavior matters, And in fact, if we don't do the right thing in response to God's grace and mercy, destruction might come. Death might happen, right? And so part of what we begin to recognize is there's something about our faith that says of us in response to God's grace found in Christ, I need to be kind and gracious. I need to help the stranger. I need to love people and clearly not violate them or be proud or gluttonous or lazy, right? Behavior matters. And a part of what we need to then glean is, yeah, it does. My behavior, uh, fellow Christians' behaviors, it matters. In fact, Jesus himself would tell us that when it comes to judgment, our end days We are going to be judged by the way in which we lived out our faith, the ways in which we offer justice and mercy and kindness. When we reflect on Matthew 25, that's what Jesus is teaching us. And he talks about the separation of the sheep and the goat and how if we don't offer uh, drink for the thirsty and clothing for the naked and visiting those who are imprisoned and and being with those who are are sick, then we haven't done it to Jesus. And in fact, Matthew 25, 45 simply acknowledges that. When we've not done these things to the least of our brothers and sisters, we've not done them to Jesus. And we are judged. And I don't know about you, but That's one of my great fears is that I I won't be judged right. I won't be judged as if I've lived well for God. And that's our deep challenge, isn't it? The good news for you and me is that um, we have a Savior who can help us. The good news is we've got Jesus, right? And he helps us to overcome that sin and death because throughout Scripture, this behavior that is unbecoming like it was in Sodom and Gomorrah and that caused their destruction, the Scriptures would tell us over and over again, linking death and sin, that sin leads to death, sometimes actually physically, but clearly always spiritually, sin and death. Our good news is that we have a conqueror, we, we have one who has overcome that sin and death and who helps us to do the same. The Apostle Paul would write about it when he wrote to the church at Corinth in the 15th chapter. He would say, thank God that we are those who have been given the victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gift we have. But we've got to acknowledge, friends, every once in a while, not on purpose, I hope, but we We live in excess, don't we? Every once in a while, we perpetuate injustices. Every once in a while, we kind of participate, maybe not directly, but 
in sexual violence. Denomination after denomination has been lifted up recently. Our own participation in the scouting program, we're trying to uh, uh, overcome that and make amends for all of that. Even in the church, it's not just those people out there. It's not just those folks who aren't followers. It's sometimes us. And a part of what we need to recognize is our part in that. And then also acknowledge that we have a Savior to help us overcome. And that's the blessing that we celebrate. So friends, I want to celebrate with you that when we get it wrong, that when our behavior is wrong, that we still have a way forward. And we still have a God who wants to take us where we need to go. But we must always be on guard that we don't become, even unintentionally, like Sodom or Gomorrah. And that we rely heavily on the King of kings and Lord of lords who offers us the life that we so desperately need. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for the gift of life and love found in and through him. Help us, Lord, in the days that lie ahead to find the courage and the grace to not behave violently or vilely, but rather, God, to be about your justice, to offer your mercy, to be your people. God, it takes courage every single day. So give us the strength we need and help us to rely on your spirit as we seek to move forward. God, this is our prayer, and we lift it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hey, friends, let me just say thank you. Thank you for your great generosity week in and week out. You really make ministry possible, and it all becomes of your heart through generosity. If you brought a gift this morning, I want to invite you to drop them at the brown boxes at the white pillars, or of course you can always make a digital gift by scanning the QR code on the screen or by texting the letters T-M-U-M-C to the number 45777. But whatever you give, we are grateful. Thank you. foes are many, they rise against me, but I will hold my ground. I will not fear the war, I will not fear the storm, my help is on the way, my help is on the way. He will not delay my refuge and strength come through always, always. Trouble surrounds me, chaos abound me, my soul will rest in
and always appreciate the opportunity to worship together. We will not fear because our God is with us and for us and gives us the courage to keep moving forward. Well, friends, it's my great delight to introduce to you our newest associate pastor, Reverend Gracie Millard. Uh, we put together a little video so that you can get to know her just a little bit better as well. She's going to teach us a few things about TREACH. I want to encourage you to watch the screen, and then we'll introduce Gracie to you as well. to stump the pastor. I'm your host, Rupert Ping. Let's meet your contestants. Reverend Gracie Millard is a recent graduate of Perkins Seminary. Is a lifelong Methodist having been baptized, confirmed, and raised at HPUMC in Dallas. She loves dogs, Dr. Pepper, and has a deep love for serving others. Reverend Daniel Humbert spends his free time shopping on Amazon. And this is Doug. Let's start with question one. Buzz in when you know the answer. When was Treach founded? 1983, about 13 years before I was born. That's a point for Gracie. Let's move on to round two, where the points double. How do you spell Treach? I know it. T R E I S. T C H E. P R I E T S C H. How did you know that? Well done. Time for round three, folks. This one's for all the marbles. After whom is Treach named? <laughs> Irvin and Melba Treach. That is absolutely incorrect. I know. It's Irwin and Velma Treach who donated their land to this church. I actually have them as my phone background. That, that's what I meant to say. Me too. Sorry, Doug and Daniel, but we do have some lovely parting gifts for both of you. <laughs> Reverend Gracie is a pastor who can't be stumped. She's done her homework getting to know Treach, and now our homework is to get to know Reverend Gracie. I'll see you next time on Stump the Pastor! Will you welcome Reverend Gracie Millard? We're excited to have her. She brings a great experience both in youth ministry and in missions ministry as well. And she's going to be our missions pastor uh, for hopefully many years to come. Uh, I know you'll want to greet her, so she'll be in the Connection Center right after the service, so be sure to head on out there. There's some cake, uh, some ways for you to greet her and to just welcome her to let her know how much you are excited for her to be a part of this ministry uh, community. Thank you for all that you do, and may you go from this place with the strength and the hope that God provides that you can indeed know that we have courage 
and that we have the possibility to act and be God's good people every single day. May you go with that strength and encouragement. Amen. Thank you.